clash and clang of steel against shield. Fluttering banners held aloft above the bloody skirmishes of battle. Knights riding furiously across fields, trailing emblazoned flags. The pageantry of helms, plumes and crests, damsels in distress. Pomp and circumstance, fierce lions and imperious eagles. Cords, tassels, crowns and reeds. Insignias of rank and pedigree, distinction and identification. Welcome to the bold and colorful language of heraldry. Hello, I am Charles Gauci, the Chief Herald of Arms of Malta, and this masterclass is an introduction to heraldry with special reference to the nobility in Malta. Heraldry is the study of coats of arms, and coats of arms may be personal and hereditary, or impersonal and non-hereditary. But whether they be personal or impersonal, coats of arms are simply insignia of identification. Heraldry, in the form we know it today, originated in the second quarter of the 12th century. And the reason for the introduction of heraldry was the introduction of total body armor. There was absolutely no way that anybody could be identified on the field of battle if he was wearing total body armor unless he was also wearing some form of personal identification. Now it's important to understand that medieval warfare wasn't just a question of slashing at the enemy and trying to kill as many of them as you could. That was important. But what was also important was that if you saw somebody who belonged on the opposite side, who belonged to a great family, a wealthy family, you tried to capture them alive and to ransom them after the battle. Now, with the advent of heraldry, the position of herald appeared. The herald would deliver messages or challenges from his king or lord to the other side. And he was totally protected. You could not attack the herald by convention. He would have a really good knowledge of all the coats of arms in his kingdom, as well as the coats of arms of uh, families in the opposite, on the opposite side of the fence. In times of war, he would stand by the side of the king or general and give him a running commentary on what was happening on the battlefield. Who was attacking where, who had been captured, who had been slain, and, as was not at all uncommon in those days, who had changed sides. Now, eventually, the herald acquired the right to grant coat of arms under license, of, under license from the sovereign. A herald could always be identified by the clothes that he wore. He wore a loose overgarment called a tabard. Now, the herald acquired the right to grant coat of arms under license from the sovereign. With the decline in the use of armor, because of the, because of the invention of gunpowder, the original purpose of heraldry was lost, but by now it had become deeply rooted in society, hence its persistence to this day. Now arms were not only granted to aristocrats and great nobles, but they were granted also to people of substance, people who had the need for some form of identification. Remember, these were times of great illiteracy. So a coat of arms stuck on the side of a building would immediately tell the illiterate who lived in that property or to whom that property belonged, whereas a notice in script would have had little significance. Now because of the importance of heraldry, lots of people started, started to invent their own coat of arms, and indeed even in this day and age, some people still invent them. But for a coat of arms to, to have any legal value, it's got to be granted by an authority which does so by the power of the state. In England, we have the College of Arms in London, which was founded by King Richard III in 1484. In Scotland, we have the Court of the Lord Lion in Edinburgh, founded by James V of Scotland in 1532. And in Spain, we have the Chronicler of Arms of Castile and Leon, which 
can trace its roots back to the 15th century. Now, up until recently, in Malta, we have had no central authority to control heraldry. We've always relied on foreigners. However, this all changed in 2019, when Heritage Malta, on the direct instruction of the Prime Minister and the Cabinet Secretary, instituted the office of the Chief Herald. And I had the honour of being appointed Malta's first ever Chief Herald of Arms. My office is based in Fort St. Elmo, and my office has the right to use the arms of Malta in its seal, again granted to us by the Cabinet. What are the functions of the Office of the Chief Herald of Arms? Well, these include the registration of arms already formally granted by another recognised foreign heraldic authority, the creation of personal, of new personal and impersonal arms, the registration of arms which have already been established in Malta over the centuries, and finally, ecclesiastical heraldry, heraldry which is specific to members of the clergy, regardless of denomination. The 1975 Gihe Republica Act withdrew all state recognition of titles of nobility. Titles of nobility, be they Maltese or foreign, can still be freely used in Malta, but they are not recognized by the state. Let's turn our attention now to the nobility in Malta. The nobility in Malta dates back to the 13th century. The first recorded title ever having been granted is that of Baron of Fidin, granted to the Santa Sofia family in 1287. These early titles, granted by the kings of Sicily, were usually feudal titles for military services, although a few were actual purchases. All but two of these early titles are now extinct. The two titles which remain date back to 1350, namely that of Baron of Djarubnit, with the later title of Baron of Boana. All the other titles created by the kings of Sicily are now extinct. Now the Knights of St. John, as sovereigns of Malta, themselves granted several titles, some of which still exist today. These titles granted by the Order of St. John were only nominally feudal. In other words, you were Marquis or Baron or Count of a place, but you did not get the money from that land. That went straight to the Order. Although a few titles, three in all, were actually granted on land privately held by the grantee, those of Tabria, Gomerino and Catena. Other foreign titles were recognised by the Order. The system was that the individual purchased a title from a foreign monarch, then came to Malta, registered the title with the order, paid the required fee, and the title became part of the Maltese nobility. Most of the titles created by the order were purchases. The nobility made its money, gained its wealth, through corsairing, slave trading, and the importation of wheat. The money thus made was transferred into land, and land gave you status. In 1798, Napoleon came to Malta and he abolished the Maltese nobility. All the nobles had to gather in Palace Square in Valletta and burn their patents of creation. After Napoleon came the British, and the British were faced with an unusual situation. They now had a colony with its own indigenous European nobility, and this really confused them. And what did the British do? They did what they always do when they're confused. They organized a royal commission. And the royal commission in 1878 produced its findings, which ended up in the recognition of 32 titles, which constitute the Maltese nobility as we know it today. Some later titles were created by sovereign pontiffs and others by uh, people who had the legal right to create titles heads of ex renient houses who held the so-called Fons Honorum. Now these later titles do not constitute part of the Maltese nobility, but they do constitute part of the nobility in Malta. It's a subtle but important difference. Now Maltese titles can be inherited in a variety of ways, 
there's no Salic law in Malta which limits inheritance to the male line. Indeed, some titles can be inherited by nomination, which has created a lot of controversy in the, on the island, with families falling out amongst themselves because of the way a title has, has gone. The end result is, in Malta, I can safely say that no title ever becomes extinct. There's always lateral thinking which, end, which results in somebody, somewhere, inheriting the title. The nobility has been a rich source for heraldry in, in, in Malta, with coats of arms present on churches, buildings, monuments, documents, etc. The Maltese nobility has contributed immensely to the culture of the Maltese island. They have been prominent in politics, in law, in medicine and in the church. They were in the forefront of the fight against the French and forefront in the fight for the acquisition of political rights for the Maltese. So you cannot really appreciate the history of Malta unless you know something about the history of the nobility. It's important to understand there's the Maltese nobility and then there are the Maltese holders of foreign titles. The two together constitute the nobility in Malta. The Maltese nobility can even boast of two, member, two of their members who are on their way to sainthood. One of them is the blessed Adiodata Pisani, who was Baroness of Friggio and Uini in her own right. She died in 1855. And the other one is Monsignor Giuseppe de Piro, who died in 1933. Um, Adiodata is a blessed and Monsignor de Piro is a servant of God. That's the first stage on the road to sainthood. Blazin is the language of heraldry. It differs from country to country. In the United Kingdom, blazon is a form of Anglo-Norman French. It allows an individual who cannot draw to accurately describe a coat of arms to a heraldic artist who can then paint the arms. In our history, the blazon of all our ancient arms are all in Italian. But if one knows blazon, one can then translate it into one's own language very easily. The system we use in Malta at the moment is the English system of blazon. We'll now have a look at a typical complete coat of arms and I'll point out the various parts which go to make it. We have the shield, the supporters, the coronet, the helm, the mantling, the crest, the mound, the motto, and the various decorations. The most important part of the coat of arms is the shield. If you don't have a shield, you don't have a coat of arms. Now the shield can come in various shapes and sizes. That's of little importance, except when you're dealing with the coat of arms of females, they have special shaped shields. We'll talk about that in due course. What is, a very, what is very, very important is the surface of the shield. That is called the field, because it is the field that carries the all-important hereditary symbols known as charges. Now, the surface of the, sh of the shield, i.e. the field, is made more eye-catching by the use of tinctures. Tinctures can be colours, they can be metals, or they can be furs. Colours such as red and blue, jewels and azio, metals such as silver and gold, ar uh, argent and ore, and fares such as ermine or ver. A, a very common symbol used uh, or charge used in heraldry is the lion, because the lion denotes, at least in the minds of people who use the lion, strength, nobility, perseverance, all sorts of nice characters. But if you're blazoning the arms, you can't just say lion you've got to describe very accurately the position of the lion or the attitude of the lion. So if the lion is standing on all four legs, he's known as a lion statant or statant. If he's um, standing on three legs and one leg is in the air, he's patient or passant. If he's standing on one leg with three in the air, then he's rampant or rampant. If he's looking at you, he's gardant. If he looks behind him, he's regardant or regardant. His tail, 
can be a single tail, can be a double tail, can be a forked tail. And if his tail is between his legs, then he's called a lion coward. The shield is normally shown in the vertical position. However, in Scotland, it's very common to find the shield in a slanted position. This is commemorating the, the, bat, the knight going into battle with the shield hanging from his saddle in a slanted position. Now, the arms of females are not shown on a normal shaped shield, but either on an oval shield or on a diamond shaped shield. It's called a lozenge. It's like the diamond on a playing card. Here you'll see the coat of arms of the Baroness of Castelcicciano. Um, you can tell it's a female because it's in a, a diamond shaped shield and that she's unmarried because there's a garland of flowers around it. Very often the charges on a shield, or on a field rather, don't signify anything specific, but in some cases they do. Let's look at the coat of arms of the Marquises of Ein Kayet, a Maltese title of nobility. Here you can see two squares. These are Masonic symbols. Um, they commemorate uh, the ancestor of, of the Marquis, who was, the, who was known as the Count Agostino Formosa de Fremont, who was a very prominent Freemason and was exiled from Malta by Grand Master Deran. But I don't think he actually ever left the island. Um, here we have the coat of arms of the Barbaro family. The Barbaro family are Marquises of St. George and Count von Zimmermann. You notice on the coat of arms a red circle. This commemorates the fact, at least the legend, that in 1123 a Venetian warrior, Marco Barbaro, uh, in, in a battle against the Moors, cut off the arm of one of the Moors and used the stump, the bleeding stump, to imprint a sheet, creating a battle flag with which he rallied his troops to defeat the enemy. So the red circle has been used since those times by the Barbaro family. Here, another example, we have the arms of the Count Chantar Paleologo, another Maltese title of nobility. This family descends from the Imperial Paleolog family of ancient Byzantium. So you see Byzantine, Byzantine symbols on the coat of arms. You see the double-headed eagle of Byzantium and the four adorsed bees, which were specific to the Paleolog family. These arms are my own arms, granted to me by Lord Lyon many years ago. The central star of the Gauchi coat of arms has been replaced by a rod and snake to show that I am a doctor. And here, finally, we have the arms of the Count Preziosi. The, the first Count Preziosi was a warrior in the service of the Venetian Republic, and he was made a Knight of the Order of St. Mark, and so the family carry the Lion of Venice on their coat of arms. The next component of the coat of arms I want to talk about is the helm or helmet. This is only present in the coat of arms of males because in days gone by it was only males who went into battle, the females stayed at home. The only exception to this rule are the coat of arms of the sovereign because the coat of arms of the sovereign are to a certain extent impersonal arms, they go with the country. So whether the sovereign is a male or a female, the sovereign is entitled to the helm. Now, the shape of the helm varies from country to country. Each country has its own patterns. Here you can see the coat of arms of helms as used in uh, Britain, Great Britain. And we have here the helmets as used in Italy. Note this helm which is looking the other way. That's the helm used by a bastard. Um, you make descent from a very, very high and noble family to the long, wronger side of the bed. So you want to show your connection with the family, but you have to have the helm facing the other way, I suppose, in shame, to show that your descent is illegitimate. The Spanish have the same system, with the helm facing the other way. Now, Germanic arms, i.e. arms which originate from Germanic countries, Germany, Austria, and the old Holy Roman Empire, tend to use multiple helms with multiple crests. And here are some examples of multiple crests. The Count Sant Panduca, the Sant title being Germanic, and the Count um, Sant Furnier, the Sant being Germanic, and the Furnier also being a Germanic title. The next component is the mantling. The mantling is a piece of material which hangs 
from the, which used to hang from the back of the helm to protect the back of the neck from the rays of the sun. Because it's attached so intimately to the helm, it's only present in the coat of arms of males. Again, the sovereign is an exception. Now, the, the mantling is usually coloured in the, in the main colours of the shield, which are known as the livery colours. In the case of the Inguanes family, the main colours used in the shield are red and gold, jewels and ore. And these colours are reflected in the so-called livery colours, which are the colours of the mantling. We next talk about the crest. The crest can be anything you can think of. It's normally attached to the helm by means of a wreath or torse. So because it's attached to the helm, it is absent in the coat of arms of females, except with the exception of the sovereign, for the reasons I've already mentioned, and in Scotland, it is present in the coat of arms of the female heads of Scottish clans. They're entitled to a crest without a helmet. Now, I've said that the crest is attached to the helmet, but for artistic reasons, the helm can sometimes be omitted and the crest is shown flowing in midair. Here we have examples. Here we see the crest granted to Chico Gatto, first baron of Diarudnit. This crest has been handed down to his descendants and his family having married into the Inguanes family. You can see here an eagle which carries in its mouth a belt. This is referred to as the Cingolo Militare, or military belt. It was a very high military decoration awarded for valour by the kings of Sicily. So some families which descend from Cicco Gatto through the Inguanes uh, line still use this crest to this day. The arms of the Counts of Beberua, the arms of the Marquises of Fiddin, the arms of the Counts of Montalto and the arms of the Marquises de Piro. They all show the crest above the, above the shield, but not resting on a helm. Here we see an example of the female head of a Scottish clan. You can see the crest without a helm, a lozenge-shaped shield to show it's a female, and another giveaway that it's a Scottish coat of arms is the fact that the motto appears above the crest rather than below the shield. Many years ago, I was asked by the family of the late Baroness Francesca Maria Chesney Sheberas de Miconguanes to help them construct a suitable coat of arms to put on her memorial slab at the cathedral in Imdina. I advised them that since a Scottish chieftain, who happened to be a female, was allowed to use a crest, despite not being a male, then the late Baroness should also be afforded that honour, she being the closest thing we have ever had to royalty in this country. She was the Baroness of Djarlubnit, the Baroness of Boana, and the Baroness of Castelcicciano. So here on her memorial slab you will see the arms of a female, which can, you can immediately identify by the fact that the shield is shaped like a lozenge, but it bears a crest without a helm. The next component of the coat of arms I want to talk about is the coronet. The coronet, coronet of rank, denotes status within the nobility. Just as Germanic arms can have multiple helms, so they can have multiple crests. It's important to note that certain coronets are used as crests, and they are called crest coronet. A crest coronet is usually attached to the helm by means of the wreath or toss, or it's separated from the helm by means of a fold of mantling. In Malta, boat systems can operate, so unless you know exactly which family you're dealing with, it can get very, very confusing. Here we see the arms of the Marquises of St. George, of the Marquises of Taflia, of the barons of Benwarrat and the Counts of Bahria, where the coronet is placed immediately above the shield. Here we see the arms of the barons of Buda, the barons of Grua, the Counts of Maimun and the barons Gauchi, where the coronet of rank is placed immediately above the helm. 
The actual shape of the coronet will vary in, in use, given the title concerned, will vary from country to country. Here we have examples of coronets as used in the United Kingdom. Here, as used in Italy. In Italy, they have a very interesting coronet, the coronet of a noble, nobile, which indicates untitled nobility. A similar situation exists in Spain, where the untitled nobleman is referred to as a senor. In Malta, we have three kinds of coronets of rank, that of Marquis, of Count and of Baron. And then we can use these coronets in various ways and in conjunction also with the helm to indicate descent from a noble family. The situation in Malta being somebody may say that he is De Marchesi or De Conti or he is Nobile De Marchesi, Nobile De Conti, Nobile De Baroni or maybe he is the heir to the title, he is the Marquesino or in the case of the female, the Marquesina. So we can use the coronets imaginatively to show whether somebody is a title holder or a descendant of a title holder. The use of supporters varies from country to country, thus they are virtually unknown in Italy and Spain. In Malta, before the advent of the British, supporters were also unknown. But when the British came over, the use of supporters pleased the Maltese nobility and they started using supporters in their own coat of arms. In the United Kingdom, supporters are used in the arms of royalty, very serious orders of knighthood, such as the garter, in the aristocracy and in impersonal arms. Here we have the coat of arms of the Counts of Eintofirha, a griffin on either side. Now in some cases, instead of having supporters holding the shield in place, you can have a supporter behind the shield, holding the shield in place, if you like, from the back rather than from the sides. Here we have an example of one of the Holy Roman Emperors, quite a spectacular coat of arms, with the shield being held by a supporter from the back. Here we have some Maltese examples, the Baron of San Cosimo, the Marquises, Marquises of Junis Sultan, and the Baron Strigona of Montagna de Marzo. In all cases, the shield is being supported from the back, not from the sides. The motto is a phrase which is supposed to illustrate some sentiment very dear to the heart of the bearer. In English arms, it is, does not form a constituent part of the arms and it can be changed at will, although most families tend to keep the same motto. In Scotland, the motto forms an integral part of the arms and it cannot be changed without the specific authority by Lord Lyon, King of Arms. In some cases, the motto plays a pun on the name of the family. For example, the English family Salt has a motto, in sale salus. In Malta, the Fontani family, dulcis in fonte. The Gallia family, Gallia spes salutis. The Preziosi family, preziosum quod utile. Now, in Scottish arms, the motto is, is very distinctive. It is placed above the crest, as you can see from these pictures here. The slanted shield, again, tells you that these are Scottish arms. Now we come to so-called canting arms. These are arms which play a visual pun on the surname of the family concerned. Here we can see the arms of the family uh, uh, Martel, three hammers, the family Trumpington, two trumpets, and the family Tremaine, three hands. We also have canting arms in Malta. Here are the arms of the Marquises de Piro, a pear tree. Here we come to the arms of the Arpap family, seen within the arms of the Arpap Testaferrata family. Arpap refers to Arpe, which is B in Italian. So we have three Bs in the arms of the Arpap family. The Testaferrata Olivier use an olive tree. The uh, Caruana Gatto family use a cat. Fontani family, use a fountain. The Gallia Feriol, the part that refers to Gallia, use a helmet.
Here is an interesting memorial slab, the slab dedicated to Baron Chico Gatto, who died in 1372. This slab was originally in Indina, but after the earthquake which destroyed the cathedral, it was taken away with a lot of rubble and ended up in the palace of the Baron of San Marciano in Gudia. You know, it's the cat, Gatto. We now have the arms of the Baron Guglielmo Morina, three eels, the arms of the Baron Vaccaro, a cow, the arms of Baroness Paola de Castelli, a castle, the arms of the Castelletti, a small castle or a tower. Then we have the arms of Toma, garlic, Rapa, a turnip, and D'Amico, two people shaking their hands. Capes are used in the arms of foreign families. Here we have the arms of the Marquises of San Vincenzo Ferreri, the Princes of Salimbria, the, the Dukes Matte of Mondello, and the Marquises Drago. Ecclesiastical heraldry is a different branch of heraldry where tassels are used and the number of tassels indicates the position of the individual within the ranks of the church. The Anglican church has its own system, the Catholic church has its own system. They're similar, but they're not identical. Here we have the arms of His Excellency Monsignor Charles Schicluna, Archbishop of Malta. Next to him are those of His Grace Bishop Toma of Gozo. Then we have the arms of Maltese Cardinals. The arms of Cardinal Shebera Sister Ferrata. The arms of Cardinal Prospero Grec, both of whom of course are dead. And here are the arms of our present Maltese, or should I say Gozotan Cardinal, His Eminence Cardinal Mario Grec. An individual may have orders and or decorations that he's very proud of and which he wishes to, to display on his coat of arms. In this coat of arms belonging to the Count Sant Manduca, we see three orders of knighthood hanging from the lower part of the arms. In the center, we have the insignia of the Sovereign Military Order of Malta and this is flanked on one side by the cross of the Military Constantinian Order of St. George and on the other by the cross of the Equestrian Order of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem. The coat of arms may also be displayed on flags, on banners and on standards, as here the arms of the Sant Cassia family are shown displayed on this flag. Cadency is a system to show the status of the individual within the family. The rules of cadency vary from country to country, they can be simple, as, if, as for example in England, or rather complicated, as happens in Scotland. Or they can be completely absent, as happens in many countries. In Malta, we don't tend to use system, a system of cadency, but I'm hoping to gently introduce some form of cadency to try and avoid confusion in the interpretation of arms. Marshalling of arms it refers to the way coat of arms are inherited. In Britain, there's a very strict system of marshalling. If an individual wants to show the arms of more than one family within the same shield, then a system of quartering is used. Here, we see a very simple quartering with the paternal arms and the maternal arms being shown. Here we have a very complicated system of quartering. These are the arms of the 23rd Baron of Diarul Bnitan Boana, the premier title holder of Malta. As you can see, there are many, many quarterings, and I'll go through them one at a time for you. Reading these arms from left to right as you look at the shield, and going down the shield, always from left to right, we see the arms of Gatto. Morina, Inguanes, Apap, Bologna, Sheberas, D'Amico, De Piro, Testaferrata, Castelletti, and Dorel. 
The way arms of marriages are displayed in Malta is to say the least rather confusing. There have been no hard and fast rules up until now regarding the way the arms of marriages can be displayed. However, the Office of the Chief Herald of Arms of Malta is gently going to try to introduce some form of order. In this example, we have the tombstone of the Baron Alessandro D'Amico Inguanes and his Baroness who belonged to the Bonici family. The arms are shown side by side in one achievement with one coronet. We move on to another family. Here we have the Baron Francesco Gatto and his wife, the Baroness Paola de Castelli. The arms of the two family are shown side by side but joined at the edges. Here we have the tombstone at the Medina Cathedral of the Baroness Maria Francesca Carmen Sheberas D'Amico Nguanes and her husband to uh, the Chalmers McKean family. Here you can see two complete separate coat of arms, no attempt at joining the arms together to indicate marriage. We move on now to another coat of arms where we see the arms of Morina and Gatto side by side but overlapping each other. Let's move on now to a rather strange way of displaying arms. Here we have the arms of the Baron Gio D'Amico Inguanes, who displays the arms of Inguanes, superimposed upon which are the arms of D'Amico in an escutcheon of pretense. Now to me, this would indicate that an Inguanes is married to a D'Amico, but this is not so at all. Here, the individual was himself D'Amico Inguanes. Those are his inherited arms. So instead of quartering the arms, as one normally does, he decided to use an escutcheon of pretense. I know of no other example of this in Maltese heraldry. Here we have another uh, misrepresentation of arms, if I may call them that. These are the arms of a Bonici Platamone married to a Shara Cassia, yet his arms indicate the arms only of Bonici Platamone. The arms of the wife are not shown. Here we have the arms of a Sheberas Testaferrata, who was married to a Dorel. Looking at the arms, you would think that the arms on the left are Sheberas and the, and the arms on the right are Dorel. No, the arms on the left are Sheberas, the arms on the right are Testaferrata. So even though this is an impalement of arms, the arms do not include the wife. They are only the arms of the husband. Sometimes we come across a name and arms clause where an individual leaves an estate a grant of land, anything at all, to another individual on condition that the grantee changes his name to that of the grantor and also uses the grantor's coat of arms in lieu of his or in conjunction with his. Here we have the example of Marquis Filippo Giacomo Testaferrata, who in 1848 inherited the estate of the Cassar de Zain and changed his name from Testaferrata to Cassar de Zain and incorporated the arms of the Cassar de Zain family with those of Testaferrata, which are still in use today. We have various ways of showing illegitimacy in a coat of arms. If one descends from a great family, albeit through the illegitimate line, one may want to display this on one's coat of arms. There are various ways one can do this. The three most common ways are using a so-called baton sinister, using a checkered border or rotating the helmet to the opposite side. This is supposed to indicate shame, that in other words, this chap may descend from a great family, but he descends in the shame of illegitimacy. Badges are insignia normally granted to the heads of great houses, which can then be used by their retainers. Although nowadays, badges can be granted to individuals. Examples of heraldic badges, for example, in the United Kingdom, are the White Rose of York and the Red Rose of Lancaster combined into the Tudor Rose. Richard of Gloucester, who later became King Richard III, used to use a white boar as his badge. And the, the white boar was borne by his retainers. And indeed, a, a, a boar badge was found in the battlefield at Bosworth Field.
during excavations in recent times. However, nowadays you don't have to be the head of a great household. The College of Arms, for example, in England and uh, can grant badges to individual people. This is an example of a badge granted to a Maltese knight uh, by the College of Arms in London. Adopted issue can either use the arms of their adoptive parents or they can use the arms of their natural parents. If they use the arms of their adoptive parents, then they normally put a symbol on the shield to show that they are using these arms by adoption, not by consanguinity. Arms can be granted to commemorate some great event or can be altered or augmented, as the term is used, to commemorate an event. Now, arms may be granted or may be augmented, changed in some way, enhanced in some way, to commemorate some great event in the history of the family. Let's take some Maltese examples. Before the great siege of 1565, the Viani family used the coat of arms with a dog quietly walking along, minding his own business. It is said that during the great siege, one of the Vianis displayed great heroism in the fighting. As a result, after the great siege, his arms were changed to display this courage. And we can see the decapitated head of a Turk being held by two armored arms in the center of the shield. The Viani arms appear in the arms of the Testaferrata Moroni Viani family. Heraldry, as devised by the Emperor Napoleon, so-called Napoleonic heraldry, has its own rules and customs. But if you see a coat of arms similar to the one we're showing you at the moment, that is an example of Napoleonic heraldry. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation on heraldry and that it's whetted your appetite to study the subject in a bit more detail. If you wish to get in touch with me to discuss the possibility of having your own coat of arms created, please don't hesitate to get in touch. My email address appears on the screen. Thank you very much and good day.